host, Jank Uger. All right. Listen, uh, you know, I've been getting some emails about uh, our broadcasting from New York not being up to snuff. I hear you a million percent, okay? And, hey, look, we got new lighting. A little improvement, we hope. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I just, look, this is not to make excuses. Yeah, you know, building a whole new studio in New York turns out to be not an easy thing. But it's not about that. What I want to tell you is I just want all of you to know we are not complacent about it. Behind the scenes, we are working very hard to make sure we get you a better quality product, okay? But part of the reason I bring that up today is because, look, in the final analysis, and th I want to thank all the members, everybody else for hanging in there, etc. But in the final analysis, oh, we're still trying to bring you the same content, man. And the reason I bring that up today is because I I'm excited. I think that there is something afoot here uh, that uh, not a lot of people are aware of. And I'm going to bring that to you today. And sometimes we do shows that are worth the price of admission. We had a great one a couple of weeks ago on a Friday that I thought really got to the heart of what was wrong with the system and how we can begin to fix it. Today, I'm going to tell you about the beginning of the rebellion. It has started. So that's incredibly encouraging news. One of the uh, things that I view my role to be on this show is a dot connector. Uh, you see the dots. A lot of people see the dots. Uh, my job is to connect them. And you'll see exactly what I'm talking about when I uh, get into that story, which I'm going to do first. But, of course, also we're going to have updates on Japan. And now, of course, the Republican reactions are loathsome and they're rolling in, et cetera, et cetera. But mainly we're going to talk about the heart of what's going wrong in Japan and, and the implications of that. Uh, we've got uh, madness in Bahrain. We've got madness all over the world. And then Jim DeMint has some unbelievable comments about God and government, etc. So uh, all the things that are the worst about the Republican Party are in full display, and they're going to be part of that first story as well. So let's get started. Um, all right. For so long, we have been waiting for the rebellion. <laughs> now, for some people, possibly including myself, we thought when we elected a guy who campaigned on change, that uh, the rebellion might have begun as to the really what is the empire, right? What is the establishment, the power system in Washington? Now, a lot of people in Washington have no idea what I'm talking about when I say things like that. But look, people make money in certain ways, and what they do is they try to protect that money and they try to protect that power. And the way that they do that now in Washington is by uh, hiring lobbyists to buy the politicians. That we've gone over this a million times. It, it, the rest of the media almost never talks about it, but you guys are familiar with it. When I talk about the rebellion, I'm talking about people standing up and going, that system doesn't work for the average American. That system doesn't work for the middle class, and we've got to fight back against it. So as we've learned over the last two years, unfortunately, the man uh, to lead that rebellion is definitely not Barack Obama. He is part and parcel of the establishment, and I can't tell you how profoundly disappointing it is for me to tell you that. And it took me a long time to get there, but I am definitely there. Now, me being there is not as relevant as some other uh, players at hand getting there. And it appears that finally some actual nationally elected Democrats are there. They are tired of waiting for Godot. And that is what I have said before and now literally what Congressman Anthony Weiner has said. I'm going to give you his quotes in a second. But Congressman Weiner, Congressman Peter DeFazio, Kucinich, etc., finally saying, no mas, we can't take it anymore. We're going to tell you how to really fight back and not wait on Obama. Thank you. The rebellion has begun. Okay, That is just point number one. There's other points as to why I think uh, it is headed in that direction. But let's get started with that. First, uh, Congressman Weiner saying, look, the Republicans are always on message. You might not agree with their message, but they always say smaller government, smaller deficit, and lower taxes. And they repeat that over and over. It might not even be true, but they just repeat it to the point where everybody knows what they stand for. He says, where is, where is our leadership? Where is the Democratic leadership telling you what we stand for? So now here comes some quotes from uh, Wiener. Number one, he says, on our side is this weird, squishy, affirmative sense of what government should do and how we're opposed to this cut and that cut, rather than saying, here are the things, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, environment, and education, 
We're not cutting those. Those are off the table. That's non-negotiable. Okay? He's saying, stop being squishy. Make a stand and say, this is what we're for. We're for protecting these things like education and Social Security so that people can retire in peace and not have to eat dog food when they retire. That There's nothing wrong with that. Be proud of that. And if you're confused as to whether he's addressing that to the president, you won't be confused for much longer. He continues. We haven't really done that really we haven't really done that very well. That's because the president fundamentally he's not a values guy. He wants to try to get the best deal for the American people, and that's virtuous in its own right, but it becomes very difficult to make a strategy. There's been much greater global strategy thinking on progressive media outlets, frankly, than at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Now that's the quote that's getting everybody's attention. The president is not a values guy. What does he mean by that? Do you understand? He's saying, look, it's not that he's a bad guy, and it's not that he has bad intent. His idea is you just manage the process a little bit. What I've been saying all along, he doesn't want to really change the system. He just wants to get you a little better outcome, maybe 5%, 10%, whatever it is, right? Whereas Wiener is saying, look, you've got to make our argument. It's not always about negotiating. You Sometimes saying, hey, this is where we stand. This is who we're going to stand up for. Th this is our values. Now, if you don't do that, ideologically, you're going to get run over. And that's what's been happening to the Democratic Party for at least 20 years. Reality is closer to 40 years. Okay? So, but Wiener's not done. He said... He says, if it wasn't clear enough already, quote number three, we've spent a lot of time waiting for Godot when it comes to the Obama White House. That is devastating. That is exactly right. And he says, and we kind of, to some degree, have to internalize the idea that, you know what? That's probably not the way to go. We have to start initiating some of this. Thank you very much. Exactly right. And part of the reason that Congressman Weiner gets it and some of these other progressive congressmen get it, is because you're seeing Wisconsin, you're seeing Michigan. I'm going to tell you more about that in a second. And they're saying, you know what? Waiting for the president didn't work at all. Didn't work. He ain't coming. That's what I've been saying on MSNBC. That's what I've been saying on the Young Turks. He ain't coming. Okay? But it turns out there is a knight in shining armor. It's you. It's the people who are standing up and saying no more. So now let's go to Congressman Kucinich. He's along the same lines. He says, quote, the only regret... Uh, I have is that the White House isn't fighting back against this. Referring to, you know, the Republicans cutting the budget, etc., etc., right? He says, it's one thing to say, while I stand behind the workers, how far behind, I don't know. It's another thing to say, I stand with them and in front of them to protect the rights, and I'm waiting for that to happen. And Kucinich basically pointing out, Obama has not stood with the workers, whether it's in Wisconsin or any other state. You guys know that Obama has this laid out plan for the next two years. And the first th part of the plan is cut spending and prove to Washington, and he thinks the rest of the country, that he could cut spending just as well as Republicans. And he will not get shaken off of that plan. This is the downside of no drama Obama. My God, man, look up. Look up. You're down on your plan like this. Look up. There's protests all over the country. 2,000 people showed up the other day just because Scott Walker was having a meeting. 1,000 people showed up in Michigan to protest Governor Sp Snyder. Look up. There's a movement going on in the country. You're missing it entirely. But luckily, some of these congressmen are no longer missing it. If you thought those were tough, listen to Pete DeFazio uh, and other progressive congressmen. He says, quote, the problem is the negotiator in chief and where he'll end up and whether we can put some steel in his spine. I assume he caved in on taxes in December because he was blackmailed on treaty with Russia with nuclear weapons, which was absolutely critical. But that's pretty pathetic also. Those are strong words, man. Those are fighting words. Here a progressive congressman saying, enough is enough. No moss. No, don't wait for Obama. It's time to fight forward. Whatever forces we got, we got to marshal them together and just start taking the fight to the Republicans. Enough with all this nonsense about, oh, please, how, how much spending cuts can we do from the middle class? How can we help you? No, we're not here to help you. For the Republican Party, we got a message for you. For the power establishment, for all those rich donors, we got a message for you. We're coming to kick your ass. That's the new message. That's the rebellion. That's what I like. Now, that is words. Are you ready for action? 
uh, Jan Schakowsky has put together a bill in the House that is going to be hard to refute. And that's not me saying it. That is apparently some Republican congressman telling their Democratic colleagues. I didn't know they still had conversations, but apparently they do, saying, oh, man, we're going to have trouble with that one if that comes through a vote. Hopefully it'll never see the light of day in terms of a vote. What is it? Schakowsky is pro uh, promoting a bill uh, that would raise taxes on millionaires. Only for money, not just for millionaires, but extra dollars above a million dollars. So even if you're a millionaire, for your first million in taxes stays as it is, okay? But if for every extra dollar above a million dollars, she's going to increase taxes with this bill. Um, now, let me tell you what the tax rates she's proposing are. Let me tell you how much money it would raise and how popular it is, okay? Uh, for $1 to $10 million, you, the rate would go up from 35% to 45%. For 10 to $20 million, this is income per year, okay? It'd go to 46 percent for 20 to 100 million 47 percent these are not outrageous numbers eisenhower had it, had it at 91 percent she's nowhere near it and for a hundred million to a billion dollars per year in income that you're getting your taxes would be go up to 48 percent and 1 billion and over 49 percent it doesn't even get to 50 percent for billion and over this is this is the most reasonable bill in the history of mankind, right? So how much money would it raise in just next year alone? It would raise $78.9 billion. That's much more than the $61 billion in cuts that the Republicans are proposing. So when they say they care about balancing budgets, nonsense. You want to balance the budget? This is how you do it, okay? Will the Republicans go along with this? Oh, hell no. But... Why? Because this is their base. These are the people who got them elected, people making over a million dollars every single year. The other thing Schakowsky would do is to take away the tax, uh, the special uh, rates that tax capital gains and dividend income is getting for those people earning over a million dollars. Now, if you don't know, uh, when they're earning money on the money they already have, they're paying a much lower rate than you. So when you go bust your ass and you're a teacher, you're a firefighter, etc., you get income. That gets taxed at whatever rate that your bracket that you're in. When you already have accumulated wealth and you invest that and you get capital gains or dividends back, they're only paying 15% on that. And Schakowsky's saying, all right, for your first million, keep paying 15%, even though it's outrageous. But above a million dollars, pay the normal tax rate. You can't argue with that. And the Republicans are worried because they can't argue with that. What are they going to do? With a straight face, go to the American people and go, oh, we have to protect the millionaires and the billionaires. They shouldn't do any of the shared pain. They shouldn't do any of the shared sacrifice. That's an absurd argument. Why? You know what's happening? An uh, NBC Wall Street Journal poll said, among the different ways to balance the budget, by far, overwhelmingly, the favorite way uh, that the American people have of doing it is uh, tax, raise taxes on people making over a million dollars. That polled at 81%. What are you going to do? Disagree with 81% of the American public? Now look, the Republicans have been doing it for, for a long time and then they get the money and then they deceive you with ads before the elections and then when they come in they have a different agenda, etc. We've been through it a hundred times. But if you keep pounding this message, if you have leadership behind this message, you can eventually break them down. Okay, if anyone bothered to try. And what I love about the news today is it turns out some progressive congressmen are beginning to try. And they're saying, hey, you know what? We're not waiting on the administration. They're never going to do this. It's time to attack. It's time to fight forward. I love it. The rebellion has begun. Now, that's on the national level. That's with uh, congressmen. Okay. Now, what's the third part of this? First part is the congressman saying enough with the Obama administration. Second part is Schakowsky's bill where they say, here's how you actually balance the budget, and here's what the American people actually want to do. Third part, the American people. They have risen. Now, you saw it first in Wisconsin. I've been telling you a lot about that throughout these weeks. And you had, last Saturday, 100,000 people show up in just Wisconsin. I'm not sure you understand how epic that is, okay? It's not 100,000 people showing up in Washington from all over the country. Just in one small state. That's amazing, right? But they're not done. They're swarming everywhere. Now, in Michigan, uh, Governor Snyder has done exactly what, uh, you know, uh, we've told you other governors are doing. What he's doing is raising taxes and, and cutting spending 
and cutting wages from the middle class and giving it to the rich. Let me just give you the quick details. Uh, he, is, he would eliminate income tax exemptions on private and public pensions. Okay, so he's basically raising your taxes if you're getting a pension. Now, for the people getting pensions, it isn't very much in Michigan. And so when you get, have to pay an extra on top, that hurts. That hurts a lot. Uh, and it will affect 900,000 taxpayers, and it will uh, uh, create $900 million in revenue. And there's another thing he's doing. He's also hitting the poor. He's taking away the earned income tax credit for low-income workers. That's getting $360 million. So he's hitting the elderly, he's hitting the poor, and he's cutting education. It's the worst of all worlds. Why? To give more business tax cuts. Uh, come on. No mas. No mas. And so what's happened? Uh, 1, 000, over 1,000 seniors uh, gathered at a rally at the Capitol, and uh, they were chanting things like, it's not fair, recall Rick. These recalls are picking up, man. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Uh, but Jennifer Charette, who's 55 years old from Lansing, nailed it. She said, quote, I've never been political, but this is a power grab. So she is a person who was not involved in politics, who finally gets it. And listen to her powerful quotes. She says, it's not about the budget. It's about our governor taking our money and giving it to big business. And now he wants those emergency managers. It's wrong, and it's not about the budget. This isn't about old people. This is about working America and killing the middle class. Jennifer, you nailed it. That is exactly what this is about. And people are sick of it. So that's in Michigan, over 1,000 people, right? And uh, they don't like Snyder's plan. Back in Wisconsin, a couple of days ago, uh, you know, uh, the Wisconsin governor is going to a fundraiser as usual. Give me the money. He's going to collect money from rich people. Over 2,000 people show up. And they start chanting. Um, <laughs> let's show them the chants, and then I got a great line after that from one of the protesters. crowd just erupted and kind of took took over and um, chanting recall Walker and um, we're, we're gonna we're gonna meet him everywhere he goes we are not going away I think as time goes by though even the people some of the people who are pumped up tonight outside will realize that the real thing that will change is a month or two down the road uh, all the problems they say are gonna happen aren't gonna happen <laughs> look do you hear what Governor Walker said at the end there He's saying, oh, they're going to lose their energy in a couple of months. In a couple of months, they're going to forget. And what's going to happen before the elections? I'm going to raise millions upon millions of dollars, and I'm going to run all these ads to just deceive you again. Your energy, it's being wasted. Oh, you got to show them otherwise, man. As soon as he's up for a recall, that's a year after the election, you got to recall Walker so quick. Because well, I want him to do that press conference after he's been recalled. Going, I, I, I'm, I thought it was going to dissipate. I, I didn't know they were that angry. Oh, recall Walker. Recall Walker. I'm telling you, man, these guys, they think they can pull the wool over your eyes forever. But you saw that crowd. They're coming, man. And here's my favorite quote. Uh, one sign said, Governor Walker. You probably can't remember me, but I can recall you. <laughs> I don't know why, but I love that. I think it's clever. I'm having fun with it. Okay, so let's go get him. Now, along the lines of Michigan and Ohio and Wisconsin and all and Florida and, we, and Arizona, we've told you all about these states where they are taken away from the middle class and they're giving in business tax cuts. Every single one of those states, I've laid out the case in every single time, showing you the numbers of where they're taken away from education, the poor, the middle class, and giving it the equal amount in business tax cuts. Well, the same thing is happening in Maine, okay? Uh, and Maine's teachers have already given and given and given. They, they, over the last eight years, teachers and public employees 
have uh, suffered $150 million in takebacks to their wages and benefits. Okay, that was before uh, this new Republican governor, Paul LePage, comes in. So that's a lot they've already given back. So what does the new Republican governor say? Well, of course, he wants to take back more. He would like uh, the teachers and other state employees to increase their contributions to the pension systems by another 2% from 7.65 to 9.65. He'd also like to do a freeze on cost of living adjustments for current retirees. He'd like to raise the retirement age and do a 2% cap on future cost of living increases. So all of this is significant pain for everybody in the middle class. Okay, not everybody I should say, but everybody that gets affected by this is in the middle class. Okay, so there is no shared pain for the upper class. There's just for this. So where's the money going? He's getting all this money. He says it's to fix the pension system. Well, as we see in an article in Maine, no, it's not to fix the pension system at all. None of it is going towards that. You want to know what it's going towards? You guessed it, tax cuts for the rich. The 1% of households earning over $360,000 in Maine will see their income taxes go down by $2,700. So they had to cut the teachers and they had to cut the middle class. So the guys making over $360,000 could pay $2,700 less. How much richer do they need to be? Look, I, I've said it a million times. I don't have a problem with people being rich. That's fantastic. Live the American dream. But don't make the teachers pay for your tax cuts. That's crazy, and it's counterproductive. We're falling behind in education. Gee, I wonder why. Because the guys making over $360,000 just had to get another $3,000, and we had to cut the pay of the teachers. And that's not all. It gets worse. For the estate tax in Maine, uh, he is exempting from an extra million dollars. It used to be a million dollars was exempt. Now $2 million is exempt. You know how much that costs? $30 million. And you know who it goes to? The top 550 richest families in Maine. Where's the shared pain? Where's the shared sacrifice? No, it's our sacrifice and our pain that, so that the rich get just a little richer. It's madness, okay? Uh, by the way, over half of the benefits of the proposed tax cuts of LePage will go, of course, to the top 10% in May. Nothing is surprising so far, right? Well, here's one little twist that I love in this. As he is, you know, taking away more from the pensions, et cetera, of state workers, you think, hey, wait a minute. The governor is a state worker. Is it also taking away from his pension? No, of course not. The governor is exempt from the pension cuts. Can you imagine the contempt that he has for people? Can you imagine the hubris that he has? No, no, no. Of course, my pay will not be cut. Only the pay of the plebeians and the workers and the middle class will be cut. Me? No, 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 no. I'm not a lowly teacher. I am the governor. Not only is his pay not cut, his pension, I should say, not cut at all, uh, but he actually, as soon as he retires, he starts to collect three-eighths of his salary, okay, as soon as he leaves office, I should say. Uh, do you know that for a teacher in Maine to earn the same, to get the same level of pension compared to their salary, okay, so it's, you know, comparing apples to apples, she, would she or he would have to work 25 years, because that adds up, and at 25 years later, you finally get three-eighths of your uh, old salary, okay, in your pension. The governor, the minute he walks out of office, he hasn't cut his pension at all, and he collects three-eighths of it right away. The rich get richer, and the middle class gets hurt, right? Look, that's, Maine is a great microcosm of what's happening all across the country, and people are tired of it. And when they see this, guess what? Now they're saying, recall LePage. Recall them all, man. Every single one of these governors is taken from your pocket and giving it to their rich donors. And you got to say, enough is enough. The rebellion has begun. No moss. We're coming for you. Recall all of them. Young Turks. Welcome back to the Young Turks, Anna Kasparian and Cenk Uger with you. 
All right, so I read a story yesterday that was honestly unbelievable, but this is actually happening in New Jersey. A woman by the name of Louise Marie gave birth three years ago, and right after she gave birth, she had her daughter taken away from her, and she's fighting to regain custody of her baby. Well, the reason why um, the state took her child away from her, her baby, her newborn baby away from her, is because she refused to pre-consent to having a C-section. So she goes into the hospital, she's in labor, the doctor tells her, look, we don't know whether or not you're going to need a C-section yet, but we need you to sign this form indicating that you will allow us to perform a C-section should you need it. She said, no, I would like to deliver this baby vaginally, and if it comes to the point where we have complications, then I will sign the form. Well, the hospital did not like that. So they reported her, uh, and the New Jersey Division of Youth and Family Services took her baby away from her right after she gave birth. She delivered the baby vaginally, everything was fine, there were no problems, but they still took the baby away from her. Okay, now she is fighting in court to get the baby back, and believe it or not, she has lost that court case. Okay, so the appellate court in New Jersey um, basically said that she put, put the baby's life in danger and that uh, the hospital was right, except that doesn't make any sense at all because according to the law, individuals are not legally required to consent to invasive procedures even to save other individuals, including fetuses that lack full legal status. So I, I don't really right. understand how this ruling makes any sense at all. We've covered a lot of outrageous stories on the Young Turks throughout all these years. But I actually think this is one of the most outrageous I've ever heard. Uh, Nate haven't seen their kid in three years. Three years. They had a kid. They didn't do anything wrong. And she was 100% right. There was no need to sign that report. The delivery went fine. And she, and she, she didn't even, if something had gone wrong, she would have given consent. But she just didn't want to do it without her consent at the time. I, I literally can't imagine a more reasonable case. And to have your kid ripped away from you right after birth and not be able to see them for three years? This is a crime, man. No, and the hospital's, and look, the hospital's defense was that um, she was being, or their argument was that she was being combative, uncooperative, erratic, inappropriate. She's in labor. If ever there's a time for a woman to be erratic, it's when she's about to have, about to deliver a baby vaginally or give birth to a baby in any way, shape, or form. Okay, so I don't understand what that argument is. For them to even bring it up uh, during court and have a judge listen to it and think, yeah, that makes sense, I think that's probably one of the most egregious parts of this story. Like, I, I, it, yeah, look, 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 look. I mean, it's like that anger management uh, movie with Adam Sandler when they're like, be calm, sir. He is like, I am calm. And then they tase him. And it, it's, wait a minute. You're telling me you can take my kid away. I'm in, in the middle of labor. And then when I get upset about it, then it's that I'm being erratic and I'm upset. And so then you got to take my kid away. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy and it's crazy. Look, the thing is, this makes, this gives the government such a bad name, right? These are the kind of things that people look and they go, oh, look at the bu bureaucrats. Look at them taking away your kids, etc." Because they are in this case. Look, you can have sensible regulations to protect kids. You need sensible regulations to protect kids if their parents are going to do harm to them. But it, once you go overboard like this, you lose all credibility. This is madness. Give them their kids back, man. Have some decency. And what kind of court system do we have that you keep ruling against these guys for three straight years? C come on, man. This is beyond all bounds of reason. Yeah, apparently the worst thing to do in the United States if you're, if you're a woman is to get, become pregnant. Because at this point, there, there are people who are demonizing women uh, for deciding whether or not to give birth or deciding how they want to give birth. Okay, so at this point, the way a woman wants to deliver a child is no longer in her control. Okay, we should do what the Republicans think we should do with our bodies. We should do what the doctors think we should do with our bodies before there's any proof that we should do what they're suggesting. It, it's ridiculous how much we're being demonized at this point. It, it's the scariest but, thing know, in the world to have a baby in this country at this point. I, look, look, here's another angle on this that you got to know about. Part of the reason she didn't want to do it is because uh, they're now 
uh, encouraging C-sections a lot more. Why are they encouraging C-sections? One, it's become kind of a pattern and it's become kind of blasé and part of the normal procedure. And C-sections are invasive, man. They cut your stomach open, they take your innards out, then they take the baby out. It's a tough thing to go through that shouldn't be common procedure. I'm not saying the doctors are getting lazy, but they're just falling into a routine where they do it a little quicker than they really should, okay? Uh, then number two, it's how they get compensated. Insurance sometimes pays more for it. So then the doctors in the hospitals have an incentive to push C-sections. And if you don't go along with their profit motive, well, then they take your kid away. I mean, that's the part that where it goes from horrible to just revolting. And, and you understand why they did it, and it becomes... 10 times more grotesque. Right, and just to give you a statistic on this particular hospital, they have a 50% C-section rate. So 50% of all That's women... That's crazy. 50% of That's all crazy. women who come into this hospital have a C-section. I mean, if that doesn't 50%. give it away right there, I don't know. 50%. There's, there's, no, there's no way that 50% of the women delivering should have C-sections. No way. Look, I know people... We had a C-section. And, and I, my friends have had C-sections because they needed it. They were in breach, okay? I'm not against C-sections. I, I, my wife and I made the call at some point for ourselves on that, right? But to have 50% of the pregnancies end up in C-sections, that's unjustifiable. The reason they're doing it is because of the money. Come on, how sick is that? Yeah, like I said, scariest thing in the U.S. for a woman at this point is to conceive a conceive a baby like it, it, it we've we're getting to the point where we're losing our rights okay and but people are asleep I mean this particular story was reported by change.org and that's it and then someone on Huffington Post a blogger picked the story up and did a little more research and provided a more detailed report on this story nothing else try to google this you won't find any major media outlet talking about this story at all and this is such an important story Okay, because this is a country where we're supposed to have rights, and they're being taken away from us while we're falling asleep. All right, uh, let's go to the next story. So there was a new report that came out by PISA, and what PISA does is it does a comparative study uh, on education internationally. So they look at different countries, and they try to figure out why the most successful countries are so advanced in education. So right now, China, Singapore, um, uh, and European countries are on the top of the list, okay, and the United States is falling behind. Well, what PISA found was that other countries think of teachers as nation builders, whereas in the United States, it's no longer a high status job, okay? Uh, the average salary for a teacher is $33,000, which is nothing. Okay, and I got to keep it real. You know, when I was in school and when I was trying to decide what to do with my life and what to do with my career, education has always been a passion, but there was no way I was interested in becoming a teacher if I was going to make $33,000 a year. So I immediately started thinking of other things. Okay, and that's the way a lot of other people in the U.S. are thinking about education and a career in education at this point. So um, the first thing that this piece of study did was look. United States, the first priority that you guys need to have is to raise the status of teachers. So whether or not that's going to happen, I don't know, but there is a charter school that 60 Minutes did a really fascinating report on, and it's known as the Equity Project Charter School in New York City. And what they started doing is uh, they started hiring teachers, and it's very competitive. And what they do is they pay their teachers a salary of $125,000 a year. Okay, but you know, there, there's a little give and take there because A, it's competitive, B, the teachers are evaluated constantly by the school's administration. So some of the administrators will sit in on the classes to see how effective the teacher is in the classroom. And it's interesting because this is a case study that demonstrates how important it is to really take a look at the teachers and really change the status of the teachers. And, you know, even though progress at this school has been slow, you can see that it's growing. You can see that the students are doing much better when it comes to testing, when it comes to their reading levels, when it comes to their math levels. It's re a really incredible case study. So I know there are a lot of different factors that come into play when it comes to improving education, but I think one of the most important aspects has to do with um, basically making teachers feel like 
their jobs are worth it at this point because they are nation builders and we don't think of them that uh, way all right a couple of things here first of all you know some republicans you know treat uh, teachers with disdain and say oh you know they get out at 2:30, and we've shown you clips where so many people on fox news are saying th this and uh and they get the summers off it's an easy job have you ever had a friend who's a teacher i have and if you care about the job, it is not at all easy. First of all, you have to get in super early in the morning. Second of all, you have to grade exams. You have to grade essays. You have uh, to do all extra study for some of the kids after school, et cetera, et cetera. So, no, your job doesn't end at 2.30. And I don't know. I just find great disdain in people who say uh, frame it that way. And a lot of the people have to take jobs in the summer because they don't get paid enough as a teacher during the regular year. And... Look, it just goes towards our values. What are our values? What do we put value in, literally, right? And right now, we put tremendous value in a bunch of jerk-offs here in New York who move money around, okay? And we put almost no value on the people who we entrust with our kids. Now, you want to know the real reason why that happens in a lot of cases? Because these guys, this is part of the story that we told you about yesterday. None of their kids are going to uh, public school, they're all going to private school. So the top 1%, et cetera, their kids aren't in your schools. So they don't care how bad your teachers are. They know how bad your teachers are. That's why they're paying nineteen, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year to send their kids to private school. And they value education. Look at how much money they put into it. And those teachers get paid better. So when it's their kids, oh, yeah, then teacher, education matters a lot. When it's your kids, well, you know what, let's cut teachers' pay. Yeah, you know, during the post-game show, um, JR and I have been talking about uh, Canada, and we've been talking about tax brackets. It, it, it sounds boring, but it's actually super interesting, because when it comes to federal taxes in the U.S., uh, according to my tax bracket, I pay 25% of my income to federal taxes. And in Canada, they spend 15% of their fed, uh, income on federal taxes. It, it's incredible, right? And we pay more in taxes which I think is fine if we get more in return, right? But we don't get more in return. The majority of our taxes go to defense spending. If we stopped paying private contractors, do you know how much money we can save and how much of that money can go toward education and the people that are the actual nation builders of the country? I, it, it amazes me that where our priorities are at this point. Hey, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Jill Pike, who used to be part of the show, of course, is now with Third Way. And, you know, I often disagree with Third Way, but they uh, came up with something that's very interesting. It's, it's a tax calculator. What you do is you enter the amount of taxes that you paid after you do your taxes this year, which we're coming up on. Uh, probably people have already done it. Me, I'm a little late, <laughs> as always. But anyway, it, the amount of taxes, you enter it into that calculator, and it spits back to you what your taxes went to. And is if you'll see if you do it, a great percentage of it goes to defense contractors. And as you see that, it, it, like, it pained me to look at it. They're just siphoning our money away and giving it to defense contractors to build nonsense crap we don't need and we're probably never, ever going to use, but that somebody gets rich off of. But when you go to you know uh, teacher salaries, what are they doing? All across the country, cut, cut, cut. That's the first place we see cuts. It's always in education whenever we face a financial crisis. That's always what happens. And it just, it, it, it amazes me because education is what's supposed to build this country. But I guess that's not a priority for people. 